Happy Wisdom Wednesday, everyone. So this week's book of the week is a classic for growth marketers. Now published back in 2017, this book becomes more and more relevant as time goes on. And that book is Hacking... Happy Wisdom Wednesday, everyone. So this week's book of the week is a classic for growth marketers. Now published back in 2017, this book becomes more and more relevant as time goes on. And that book is Hacking Growth, How Today's Fastest Growth Growing Companies Drive Breakout Success by Sean Ellis, uh, founder of growthhackers.com and Morgan Brown, who's the current VP of Growth over at Shopify. Now, if you haven't already, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Mindloom Book Reviews with Omar Khatib. Go ahead and hit the like button, turn on notifications, and this will be a great way for you to discover new books, deeper insights, and more importantly, a way to elevate yourself, whether it's in your career, self-development, personal life, or anything else. So what is growth hacking? Well, you know, there was a time when things like Dropbox and Airbnb and Yelp where nobody really knew about them. Actually, some of those companies, many of them actually, were struggling even to survive. So what exactly did they do? Well, that's where they implemented growth hacking principles. This is a term that Sean Ellis first developed when he was the first marketer and head of growth over at Dropbox. And this term was popularized by Andrew Chen, who was a head of growth over at Uber when he wrote the famous article and blog about how the new CMO is really the head of growth. So what exactly is growth? Well, let's go to the li library for a moment. The way I like to think about growth or growth hacking is what growth does for growing your market share is very similar to what uh, Eric Lees, Rees, the Lean Startup did for product development and product management, and also what Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore did to understanding market segmentation and technology adoption. So gr Hacking Growth is really one of those books that uh, is a classic you're gonna often go back to. Now, another way to look at it, which is how I first introduced the idea of growth when I became the first head of growth in the medical device industry, is if you think about marketing, marketing, uh, the traditional uh, sense, is very top of funnel, right? Awareness, branding, acquisition, and in terms of the conversion, retention, and all those other things, those happen later on in the funnel, which uh, other departments are more focused on. Now, when you look at growth, So growth focuses on the whole funnel, where not only top of funnel is focused on how do we get people into the funnel through branding and awareness and other activities like that, but once they're in the funnel, how do we drive them to a conversions? How do we make sure we have higher retention? How do we make sure to create sort of a virtuous cycle where as we acquire more and more customers, right, that starts bringing in and converting more of the market so that we start growing our market share. Now, while this is a fantastic book and has a lot of great chapters on the growth process, implementing it, developing teams. I wanna focus on the main framework of what growth is, and it can really be broken down into four specific phases. Now, the growth process can be broken down into four specific steps as illustrated by this infograph here. Now, the process is a continuous cycle comprising of four key steps, data analysis and insight gathering, idea generation, experiment prioritization, and running the experiments. And this essentially circles back and then starts continuing this virtuous, virtuous cycle of growth. You can use the acronym AIPT to make it easier. Analyze, ideate, prioritize, and test. Now, one mistake a lot of people make when it comes to growth marketing or growth hacking is that they jump immediately into high tempo testing and growth. But before you do that, there's a big emphasis throughout the entire process of growth on learning. So before you jump into growth testing and, 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 and doing a high tempo uh, growth strategy, you have to understand, is your product a must have who is it a must have for and why is it a must have? Simplify down, you have to figure out what is the core value of the product to which customers and why. Now, something to really emphasize here is that if you look at a history of the most successful companies in the last 10, 20, 30 years, it, there's a big focus on the fact that the companies that learn the fastest grow the fastest. And so if you're constantly testing, right, and not getting comfortable, you'll learn more, you'll learn faster, and then you'll constantly outpace the competition. Now, also before you start testing and going into this uh, growth process, you also have to identify essentially a source of truth, which is number one, 
what systems, whether it's HubSpot or Salesforce or anything else, where can you house all your data that you can look and analyze the insights? What are the key objectives that you're going to be looking at? What measures will, will we be analyzing? And more specifically, try and find a North Star. So that means uh, the number of users who sign up for your service for free or what percentage of people after signing up for demo convert over to customers. You have to find uh, one or two key metrics or North Star essentially. Uh, that you're going to really focus on. Of course, the most important thing in my opinion is to find that one North Star metric that everything else maps to. So now that we understand that, let's dive into the virtuous cycle of growth. So step number one is analyze, right? Now, when it comes to analyzation stage, you have to look at all the data that you have available. Maybe you don't have a lot, but you do have some data. And if you don't, you can even Google or buy market reports just to start getting an idea of what's going on in the market, what do the customers want, and how they're reacting to things. Now, in the book on page 117, you can look at a great list of questions that you can ask yourself when you're analyzing your data. And let me give it up here for a moment for you to take a screenshot of. And again, the analyzation stage, it'll go through various cycles, but when you start out, you're starting to look at your original customers. Like why did they come to you and asking very specific questions. Again, going back to those three questions I asked earlier, which is why is your product a must have for which customers and, and who they are and more specifically why? You have to start getting more curious and aggressive about it to figure these questions out. Now, the next stage is ideate. And I tell this to people all the time, whether you're in a company or you're blogging individually, the best way to have a really, really good idea is have a lot of really bad, shitty ideas, right? There's no other way to do it. There's even an old verse, I believe, in the Bible that says, the fool is a precursor to your savior, which means that you have to look like an idiot before you look really, really good, just like in nature. The baby deer before it's like a, a buck running uh, at full speed is slipping and falling all over the place, right? So to get that good idea, you have to have a lot of bad ideas, which means you have to test a lot. But before you test, stop and take a moment to, again, analyze, think about the data, right? And start figuring out what experiments can fit within the context of the growth that you've seen in that data or those key insights. Now, ideation should not be left up just to the marketing team, right? If you look at HubSpot, for example, they actually have a department or a team called Sparketing, where it's a combination of sales, products, and marketing, right? So take time to interact with other departments of the company, maybe even have once a week over lunch period so that way people can come if they want, right? But an ideation session where you're essentially talking through ideas, sharing, sharing insights, right? You have to pull your ego out of this so that way you can get the best ideas, right? And then you start creating a culture within your company that people feel that if they have a good idea, they can send it over to marketing. That doesn't mean that you're going to do every single idea, but you're welcoming it because you have to start crowdsourcing this. Believe me, you'll thank me later. Now, another part of the growth process is getting very, very organized, right? So even when it comes to ideation, you want to have some kind of a framework. So when you go into stage three, which is prioritize, you don't just do every single idea, which would be great, but you don't have unlimited budget and you don't have unlimited resources. So you have to start prioritizing. So when it comes to submission in uh, Hacking Growth on page uh, 125, they have this really nice framework. So essentially when submitting the ideas, the submitter should rate each idea on a 10 point scale, right? Across the following uh, uh, three criteria, the idea's potential impact, the submitter's level of confidence on how effective it will be and how easy it will be to implement. That helps you prioritize to say, okay, these are the experiments that actually we're going to run. Right? And I, in my personal opinion, when it comes to running certain experiments, specifically on social media, I think five business days right, or, full, or even a full week is a good enough amount of time. Sometimes you can make a decision within 24 to 48 hours of whether an experiment is good, but I feel like that's a little bit too fast. I think five, three to five business days is actually the, the uh, uh, sweet spot, at least for me in the B2B marketing world. Now, let's look at some of these areas and what that means. So what does it mean by impact? What you want to think about impact is that you know, the expectation that this experiment is going to have a direct impact and improvement on one of the key metrics, you know, the source of truth, or even that North Star metric that you're trying to improve on. Confidence, of course, is telling you how confident you are that this idea is going to generate some traction. Now, that doesn't mean that just because an idea has very low confidence means you don't do it. It could be that you have low confidence because you don't know You've never seen it done before, right? And I think there's some, in some places where it's okay to run experiments that may fail, but essentially illuminate 
a key aspect, right? And again, that goes back to an analyzing and ideation, right? It might illuminate something. So there's always something to be learned and gained even from failed experiments if you choose to look for it. And of course, ease depends on how easy it is to implement. Is it costly? Does it require a lot of prep, et cetera, et cetera. And when you take these uh, three different factors, you can essentially come up with an average, right? And then based on those averages, you can decide which ideas you're going to do first, which ones you're gonna consider doing, doing later, right? Now, nothing is perfect, but the point is to get started by being organized and having some data and metrics. The data and metrics are never gonna be good at the beginning, right? But you have to start somewhere and start comparing against something, right, in order to improve upon it, right? If it cannot be measured, it cannot be managed, and it cannot be improved on. And of course, the last one is testing, right? And there's a variety of ways of being, of testing. And of course, what you don't wanna do is get too crazy with all these different options, A-B testing, this or that. Try and make your tests as simple as possible. Just like in a science experiment, when you're working within a lab, you don't do really, really complicated experiments. You're trying to figure out if one thing happens or another thing happens. It's very difficult to test multiple variables. I don't recommend it. So try and focus on very simple things at first, such as the, you know, two different colors, right, on a, on, a, on a piece of advertising, or one word versus another word. Be very simple in your testing because then little by little, then that'll start contributing to better conversions, right, and that's really what you should focus on. One thing I do want to mention here that I think a lot of people skip out on is the analyst, a, analysis part, right, and I think that when it comes to demand gen and growth, you have to really be living within your CRM every single day. You have to keep looking at the data just to see things, right? Because when you start going through this growth process, right, more and more it's gonna start creating small wins and big wins and those things will compound and then over time, patterns will start to emerge. However, here's the thing, if you remember all the psychology books that I constantly review, humans are really bad at pattern recognition, right? We think we see that there's a pattern to something when in fact there's not. So it's always good to start looking and then testing your assumptions, right? So for example, uh, for me, a lot of times when I look at different growth channels, I'll find one growth channel and the pattern is that most of the leads are coming from the growth channel. But then you have to double down and start asking hard questions, which is, is that because my creative and copy has been really optimized for this growth channel but hasn't been done well in the other areas? Is it because my customers just happen to be in this growth channel at this timing, right? You have to ask a lot of questions. You can't make assumptions because the problem with the virtual cycle of growth is that once you find that traction channel, right, and double down on it, which is what you should do at the beginning, when you find that one traction channel, expo exploit it for all it is, but you can't get comfortable there because it takes only one little change in the market for things to just blow up in your face. Look at what happened with Facebook's uh, uh, update with Apple uh, Apple's iOS 14 update, right? That that changed the Facebook algorithm and made advertisers, you know, that much more and made advertising that much more difficult on the platform, right? So you can't get too comfortable, especially when it comes to look at, looking at these patterns. You'll find patterns and trends. Double down on that. Keep testing and analyzing, and more specifically, test outside of it. So that's your book of the week. Again, I highly recommend it. Aside from the fact that you learn these fantastic foundational principles around growth and the process, it also teaches you as a leader how to set up your growth team, how to think about the roles, how to even run the specific growth meetings and what should be reported on. So it's really got everything that you want in it. And I see it very much like these pivotal books in tech, such as uh, The Lean Startup or Crossing the Chasm, where this thing is something that you base your foundation in and you'll constantly go back to and learn from. So be sure to get it. Definitely uh, follow Sean Ellis and uh, Morgan Brown on LinkedIn and Twitter. They put out phenomenal content. I'm always learning from their posts. So be sure to follow them, engage, uh, check out their posts, and then be sure to subscribe to my channel. So with that being said, as always, hey, happy Wisdom Wednesday, and I'll see you next week. Bye for now.